I mean, really what I'm trying to get to is the great replacement theory. Um, you know, we're talking about this sort of shift in the media now where we're actually discussing this subject of like, what is the great replacement theory? Who are the great propagators of this this idea? And like one example, of course, is Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson being the most popular uh, pundit on television, having one of the most popular and most watched TV shows consistently in the United States on Fox News. Um, and you look at the clips or you look at, you know, you just watch one of his shows. Not that I've seen one from beginning to end because I can't stomach it. But I think if you've, you know, been following, of course you have, and I'm going to ask you about this, Tucker Carlson, being the most popular voice in the United States right now, he is most definitely in his rhetoric, how he's speaking, couching white nationalist ideas and the great replacement theory. Uh, and he's presenting it to his audience. Um, and I really want to ask about this because he's being, being targeted now. I mean, they're like, he's getting, when I say targeted, there, there's, there's like a real focus on him now being like, look, like the way you're talking about this is connected to directly to what's being written about in these manifestos of these white supremacist shooters of course, he denies that. But if you could talk about like Tucker Carlson's role in this sort of drift that we're you know experiencing right now to the to to the far right to fascism, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's been doing it a long time. There's that um, the New York Times did that big investigation of him that dropped in April that everyone should uh, definitely read um you know and if if you even if you don't have the times just use a incognito browser uh to read it um <laughs> yeah. and you know like all, all the browsers have an incognito or anonymous uh mode um <clears throat> where you can read a few articles for free and you know so but to get back to your point about like um you know it, so the strategy is to deny deflect and lie right and so for a long time it was like oh it's they're lone wolves and it's just like well you know how many lone wolves does it take to make a wolf pack you know there have been so many of these uh killers who basically are very explicitly um uh uh, endorsing great replacement theory, you know, Peyton Gendron, the Buffalo uh, uh, shooter who massacred mm -hmm. uh, 10 African Americans, he repeatedly cites a great replacement theory in his uh, manifesto. Uh, Patrick Crucius um, also uh, talked about a, a replacement, uh, Dylan Roof. Um, I can't remember exactly if he used the term, but it was essentially exactly yeah. what he was uh, talking about. Brendan, uh, Brenton Tarrant in uh, New Zealand yeah. was doing it as well. But you get plenty of others who they may not use the term, but that is exactly what is motivating them, right? And and great replacement for folks who don't know. It was um, the term itself was coined by this um, uh, like far right uh, Frenchman who actually used to be a socialist, uh, Renaud Camus. And uh, he he wrote a series of books, including one in 2011 called uh, The Great Replacement. And, the, and it's the idea, and it's thoroughly anti-Semitic, um, that uh, uh, elites and uh, globalists are, you know, code word for Jews, are conspiring to replace uh, white people, uh, white uh, European culture, with these dirty brown uh, subhuman uh, peoples, uh, immigrants, Muslims, uh, Africans. Yeah. And obviously yeah. in the US, it takes a, a bit of, of a different uh, turn. But you have so many of these killers, like, you know, they're ones like, um, uh, would, what was his name? Alexander Bissonnette. He's the uh, Quebec City. Mm. He killed six. Uh, Muslims after Trump's uh, uh, Muslim ban was announced because he was uh, angry that uh, Justin Trudeau announced that they were going to let in 25,000 Muslims. Bissonnette was a, a Trump fan, and so he went into a, a, a mosque and uh, uh, slaughtered uh, six um, uh, Muslims. There was a guy, was it Adam Purrington? Again, right after Trump got into office, he attacked 
This is in uh, uh, Kansas. Uh, Olathe, I think, was a state. He um, attacked two um, uh, South Asian uh, uh, engineers, Indian engineers, uh, yelling at them, uh, get out of my country, um, killed one of them and bragged afterwards that he had killed an Iranian. Um, you know, he couldn't even, he, he thought they were from Iran. And of course, Trump was used that the kind of the vicious uh, um, anti-Iranian sentiment, you know, the kind of consistently the most hated community that uh, um, in terms of Trump directs a lot of um, just complete like vicious rhetoric and, and also targets as a Somali community, right? Because they're immigrants, they're, they're Muslims, they're black, they're, they're African and, and, um, uh also um i you know the um a congresswoman um from uh, minneapolis oh my god i can't believe i'm blanking on Ilan her name omar. is it Ilan omar? yeah yeah elan omar she's she's you know a very uh prominent uh somali american very progressive uh, mm-hmm. a refugee herself there was an incident even before uh the 2016 election where they lose these um, three guys who call themselves the Crusaders, where I think this was in Wichita, were planning to wipe out an entire complex of uh, Somali uh, immigrants. And um, they were actually going to wait to do it after the election because they didn't want to um, do anything to hurt uh, Trump's uh, uh, electoral prospects. Yeah. But they they assumed he was going to lose. And and there are all sorts of other incidents. You know, the, the latest piece I did for the raw story about the, the replacement killers, you know, the, how Trump and uh, Tucker spawned a, a new breed of terrorism. I start out with this one killer that virtually no one remembers by the name of Keith Luke. Um, he uh, went on a rampage the day after Barack Obama, the first black right. president, was inaugurated. And he developed you know and it sounds exact you know it's just like when you look at the details of the case he sounds exactly like peyton gendron you know this basically a former troubled high school student a loner got radicalized on the internet um uh, uh, you know he surfing white nationalist websites he hatched this plan over months and uh what he decided was he was going to kill as many non-whites as possible and he also blamed the jews like you know it's easy easy enough to google up uh, these manifestos and peyton uh, gendron has a lengthy section on on jews and that they're the real problem but you know he's like we have to act now and so that's why he he chooses to go after this uh uh black people in this uh supermarket yeah you know there's there's several threads i want to this always happens at this point in the interview where I'm like, man, there's so many different directions to go in. But there's, <laughs> there's, there's this. Okay, there's. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to articulate this. Um, I remember in the first interview we did, you talked about we could effectively call them pogroms in the U.S. where, where there were massacres throughout the say the 20th. Just take the 20th century. Right. Massacres. Right. State state supported massacres. The yeah. Texas Rangers began as a yeah. death squad. Again, right. Google it, look it up. There's yeah. been right. a lot of scholarship done in the last 20, 30 years. Thousands right. of, of brown people they massacred along the border. Right. There is this quality of just whiteness itself, which is it's it's so like you talk about the body and you're thinking about that sort of visceral, like there's this thing that happens when, like you said, even just even if it is a symbolic thing, a black man is is a president of the United States. That is so deeply upsetting to a, a, a rather large subset of the U.S. population and elsewhere. You mentioned in Montreal, so this isn't just the United States, but in in the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere, there's something just so it's so repellent to uh, again a very large subset of the white population that they the the inclination is to massacre groups of people that are viewed as subhuman there's just like this deep characteristic of whiteness that is so murderous it's like it's 
I know this is an obvious thing to state, but it's just like when we, we have these things happen over and over and it happens in different forms in different ways. I, I do not see what happened in Buffalo or any of these other places as being any different from lynchings that happened 100 years ago or less, 50 years ago, whatever. It, it It's like there's a pattern and it's being followed. And I think as white identity feels threatened in some form however it it just this sort of violent out these violent outbursts start happening it's like the body is fighting it, it perceives itself as fighting a disease and i i just had to comment on that i i don't know what you had to contribute to that i just really wanted to like that's what comes up in my mind when you say all these things well, you know, we, we, we go back to um, when Trump began his campaign, you know, that uh, Mexico is not sending their best. They are rapists, they're criminals, they're drug dealers. And at one point early on, he went on about how they're, you know, poisoning our youth. And um, the previous year in, in 2015, I went to, this was for an investigative report. I went undercover uh, to the conference of a national sheriff's association. And it was, it was just utterly fascinating. I could have, uh, I was writing about uh, these things known as uh, jail debit cards. Uh, it's another way to rip off the poor. You take their money right. and you give them a debit card with fee instead of giving their money back when they get out of jail. Mm. So in any case, I went to all these different panels I, and it's just like everyone, I could have written a fascinating article. And one of them, was uh, about and you had like top level like um uh, u.s officials like you know kind of like undersecretaries from dhs who show up and and talk to uh, sheriffs um from around the u.s and and this one panel on the border crisis, you know, because it was I think it was in 2014 where, you know, there was that huge surge of uh, migrants uh, uh, from uh, Central America, thanks uh, uh, in large part to Hillary Clinton uh, supporting the coup in Honduras um, that, uh, you know, led to this kind of like death squad government and, uh, um, you know, completely like destabilize the country even more um, and uh, ended up at one point i mean it was astonishing that like i looked at the data like um it was a few percent i think it might have been like one year like close to 10 percent of hondurans um were like i um recorded uh coming into the u.s i mean it was mm -hmm. ab absolutely astonishing in numbers maybe not 10 percent, but it was mm -hmm. it was like a massive amount were 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 fleeing uh the country and so these DHS officials were talking about they went into every single border community to do a town hall. And remember, they are talking. I'm in this this conference room with all these like sheriffs, you know, and sheriff's deputies in there. And the DHS officials were saying, you know, we got the same three questions everywhere we went. Um, are they um, uh, bringing in crime? Are they terrorists are they bringing in disease and even then i was like wow yeah. you know it just like okay that is like pretty you know it's it's all about the idea that the body is being corrupted and the way this relates to fascism fascism is this kind of like a cross-class project of a uh, um a national renewal, right? And it's 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 about like reaching back to the past as as a program for the future. That that's why uh, MAGA is is has this fascistic quality to it. It's not necessarily fascist, you know. Trump got uh, stole that from Ronald Reagan. You know, Ronald mm. Reagan is is the one who uh, used uh, MAGA Make America Great Again in his 1980 campaign. Mm -hmm. But it's it's about, you know, this notion of, of reaching back to the past and this idea that there was this kind of like unspoiled, pure community, right? Corruption and, and, and purity. And these immigrants are bringing in, in disease, they're bringing in crime, they're bringing in drugs. This is this is a poison. And it's all kind of like 
it's laying the groundwork for the idea of, of great replacement. And great replacement, it's a very simple idea, right? The idea that white people are being replaced by the, these, you know, um, unwashed subhuman hordes. And it, it goes far back in, in U.S. history. There's a um, viciously racist, anti-Semitic lawyer, um, the figure on the right who was uh, uh, in elite circles, Madison Grant, uh, who who uh, wrote this uh, book about like um, the passing of the great race, where he called the Nordics uh, uh, the great race, uh, the master race, and and that uh, you know the w- they needed to be protected um, uh, against these uh, subhuman peoples who had to be uh, eliminated or or deported. There's a famous uh, Jim Crow senator, Democratic senator from Mississippi, Theodore Bilbo, who in the early part of the 20th century also espoused like very vicious, um, great replacement uh, ideas. Um, I'm trying to remember who the neo Nazi who came up was it David Lane with the concept of white genocide mm-hmm. um, and he's also you know coined the I believe he was the one who coined the 14 words which Peyton uh, Gendron uh, uh, explicitly uses in his manifesto we must uh, secure uh, an existence for our people and uh, or we must secure an, a, a, an existence for white people and a future for our children right that 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 is kind of the the great replacement white genocide in in a slogan and then so you know and and actually it's even just you know like how 1312 has become this kind of like antifa you know all cops yeah. are bastards yeah. um 1488 is this fascist so 14 words and 88 h 88 which is h h or heil hitler Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's a great replacement is a very simple concept to understand, and so it, it's it's been around a long time, even if it hasn't used that that terminology, and that's why you know I I I've been covering these killings for a long time now. And that's why when uh, this this happened, I went back and and looked back at the Keith Keith Luke, where he went on this rampage in Brockton, Massachusetts, in January of two thousand and nine, and he ended up killing a. a there's a, a Cape Verdean community there. He ended up uh, killing two uh, immigrant immigrants from Cape Verdean, um, raping and uh, critically uh, wounding a third. Um, and you know, the, just the similarities, like he, uh, Peyton, uh, uh, Gendron, uh, I. So I have no interest in watching the live streams. I mean, you know, I've I've seen plenty of uh, horrible stuff in my life, and if it, I felt yeah. it necessary, I'd watch them. But it, you know, it's been widely reported that at one point uh, he apparently shot the store manager who was white and he was cowering and as he was going around the store looking he was killing off wounded people uh he came across the store manager cowering behind a register and uh Peyton uh, Gendron is just like oh sorry and uh he levels his gun at him then apologizes and, and goes away without shooting uh Keith Luke uh, did the same uh thing he he apologized to the cops afterwards for shooting at them because they're white um then there's another the case from Massachusetts uh, last year, I forget the um, uh, the killer's name, um, but he was again he was t- targeting uh, black people and uh, their uh, white uh, bystanders uh, who said, you know, he just ran right past us with his guns, didn't even uh, point. You know, he was going specifically um, uh, for black people. So it's it's very explicit, even when they don't leave a manifesto, or even when before the the term was invented. But to get back to, you know, the first point you made, so there have been so many of them that, you know, the first strategy was like, oh, it's lone wolves. And well, that doesn't work anymore when you could just rattle off their names, right? Robert Bowers, Tree of Life Synagogue, John Ernest, the Poway um, uh, Synagogue uh, shooter, Patrick Krugis, Dylan Roof, you know, it's just like, I commit these names in memory because I'm going to be like, I'm going to rattle them off at you because you own them, right? You, yeah. you know, the right has spawned um, all the all these killers. So that was the strategy for a long time. Even you know, someone like Nicholas Cruz, like 
he, uh, the Parkland, uh, the uh, high school uh, shooter where he killed 17. Now, that wasn't great replacement, but he was railing against Jews and blacks and, and uh, immigrants um, on social media. He was a Trump uh, fanatic. He even put a MAGA hat on um, the remains of his dead mother at her funeral um, and took an Instagram photo. I mean, these these are sick people. And yeah, yeah. They're, they're mentally disturbed. But why is it that they're all right wing? You know, so and you you look at um, Reveal um, did a report a couple of years ago, uh, David Newert, who's really one of the uh, uh, best, uh, longest standing uh, uh, writers on uh, the extreme right wing going back over 30 years now, um, uh, uh, right wing, uh, far right extremism. Uh, he, up through 2019, um, so basically right before the start of the pandemic, um, they went through, I think it was over a decade of extremism. Um, and, you know, there's uh, Islamic extremism, uh, 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 religious based terrorism in the U.S., but the m majority is right wing e extremism. Mm -hmm. But they also included left wing extremism. It's almost non existent um, in comparison. And the thing yeah. about, you know, yes, you know, we can say th there's certainly um, uh, Islamic extremism that exists, but, the, you know, the uh, who was it, uh, Nadal Malik, the um, major who shot up uh, the uh, army base in uh, Texas, um, you actually look at their motivations and they're very, and he's someone who basically became deep disturbed by the Afghanistan war, they're always citing U.S. foreign policy. They're citing something real. Um, that doesn't ex in no way excuse, um, you know, the terrorism, the killing of, of innocent people. Um, but, you know, this is something that's long been predicted, you know, and, and it's also that's what led to 9-11. You know, it's, it's just like Osama bin Laden cited U.S. policy uh, in the Middle East. Yeah. So in any case, with the right wing terrorism, though, this is nothing real. It's all a fabrication. And it's something that is being completely stoked by Trump. Right. He like threw open the doors to anti-Semitism. You know, he's he used a lot of anti-Semitic memes um, in his uh, uh, campaign in 2016. Um, later, he was retweeting accounts um, that were promoters of great replacement theory. Of course, he was viciously racist. Um, uh, you know, and there's this whole history, you know, people coming forward, like when, you know, when he would visit the casinos, the managers would get all the black workers off the floor, him and his family were sued by the uh, Justice Department, then they entered into a decree for uh, racist uh, uh, discrimination um, in their properties, you know, as usual, they didn't admit to any wrongdoing. Um, you know, the Central Park Five, uh, just paying for ads, calling for lynchings of these innocent youth and to this day, still claiming he did nothing wrong and they're guilty, even though they were completely exonerated. Um, so, you know, he has basically blown open the, the doors uh, to all these ideas. And fascism is very much a dynamic that it constantly needs enemies that, it can, you know, it's 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 this um, uh, idea that uh, society is permanent warfare. You know, the the, the whole the whole kind of like theory about the nation and the nation nation state you know you're a nation by who whom you exclude and fascism is even more explicit in this regard like you know who you are by who who cannot be part of of the community who is not part of the nation who is the you know um the untermensch the subhumans uh, who are corrupting the pure nation and so there's this constant need to have enemies that fascism cannot survive without enemies so it's this is total warfare that will never end that that's why fascism always ends in disaster 